oftentimes we think of emotion as a weakness. Uh, most men are taught to be happy or angry. Uh, sometimes we can be sad, but only at maybe a funeral or we can show emotional tears when our team wins at the Super Bowl. But beyond those three, we're really at a loss for what we're allowed to demonstrate in our culture. And we see it all the time when politicians cry, they get lambasted. When um, someone shows any sort of... He who paints in the dark cannot use his brush to paint my life by Benjamin A Alkin? Aiken? Is that Aiken? Aiken. Uh, yeah. Aiken. Uh, my friend Brian, uh, let us know what this means to you. Yeah, so Benjamin Aiken was my childhood friend uh, who tragically died in a car accident when I was 16. Um, he was just one of those old souls early on, like would just write and write, and it was channeling Thoreau, Emerson, all of the, you know, 1800 philosophers. And after he died, we found you know, in his journals all of these amazing quotes. And this was one of those quotes that um, stood out to all of us in our friend group. And it stayed with me through the years because I don't want to, not that there's anything wrong with darker colors or, you know, <laughs> any one color, but I think for me, the, the quote of how do we paint our life needs to be vibrant, needs to be out there and connected and weaving in so many things that we pick up along the way, right? If, if you say your best years were in middle school or high school and you're 50 years old, then something, something's wrong, right? Something was missed by you yes. or by your friend group or something, right? We need to always be moving forward and celebrating the next great adventure. And I think for me, uh, you know, he obviously has held a significant influence on my life because it's been almost 30 years since he passed. But uh, that quote just kind of always is a centering point for my my journey and something I like to to weave into retreats or conversations with with young people as they set forth on their life. I love it. And this really leads right into sort of one of the um, some of your main um, efforts in your life. So you've got fathering together, you're putting together Father's Friday. Can you tell us about the journey of how you came to supporting and building communities for fathers and sort of the genesis of of this entire movement? Uh, specifically, we'll, we'll talk about fathering together first. Sure, sure. A friend of mine actually recently I reconnected with them and they they learned about you know fathers fathering together and all the things I'm doing now because it's been you know 20 years since we connected and we were friends in high school and he was like not surprised at all because I've always been kind of a community builder I was always that guy in high school that rounded up friends to go do something on the weekend whether that was camping or hiking or you know just going to grab dinner and he saw this massive community that I had built with my friend Chris and he was like, sign me up. How do I help? Uh, this is great. And it all started because I was a dad with two daughters that didn't have a community. And right before my second daughter was born in the summer of 2016, I looked around. None of my friends had children yet. My firstborn was about two years old. And I realized I was kind of struggling to grow and mature with her as she started to grow into the toddler years and here comes the second one along the way and my wife had all of these networks both online and in person that she was connecting with you know weekly exercise groups uh support you know nights mom night out you, you name it she had connections already designed and built for her and oddly enough i i kind of put it out there to a couple of friends that i was annoyed that there was nothing for dads and someone connected we me connected me to my alder person, uh, who was also a dad with some sons. And he said, Hey, let's grab a beer at this bar, bring your friends. And that was literally eight years ago, excuse me, seven years ago, uh, this month or maybe last month and on and off for the last seven years from every month, we would get together evolving door of people, right? People come and go and people kind of age out as their kids get older or they age in when they have kids but it just kind of became this rudimentary community i, I founded 
And then Chris Lewis, the other co-founder of Fathering Together, said, hey, I'm starting this Facebook group. Will you join me? I said, sure. Within two years, we had over 100,000 dads with daughters joining, looking for support. And we really saw some brokenness there, right? Some incomplete understanding of who we are to be as men, as fathers. And you can only see the same question posted so many times before you realize maybe there's a solution here. Maybe we could be working towards something better than just posting photos of our camping trips or, hey, my daughter had a birthday. Wish her a happy birthday. All of those are great things, not discounting those. But when you have people reaching out for with cries of help, with cries of suicide ideation and pain and depression, something needs to be done. And so I told Chris, we got to do something more than a Facebook group. And we rounded up some friends and colleagues. And out of that, Fathering Together was born. And then, of course, the pandemic struck and we had to rearrange all of our strategic plans to just become a virtual space. And now we're kind of in the throes of pandemics pretty much over, hopefully. You know, uh, what's next? How do we convert all of these virtual connections on multiple platforms? Because we're not just on Facebook anymore. But how do we convert all these people into live community, live support, but also having adventures and fun? And that's, you know, kind of where Father's Friday comes in. So we can get to that, but it, I'll, I'll pause there. I um, I think this is fantastic because this is one of the big issues in Genesis of Feel Good Fatherhood. It's just that idea of when I was looking around, just being completely isolated. What I think is really nominal is that I don't think this is an odd experience for most men today. I think by and large, most fathers are maybe not down to suicide ideation or on, on the extreme end of it, but most of us are lost. Most of us don't really know uh, how to proceed or what what this kind of looks like. Our models are, um, my, my joke is always like, there's only so much, um, and as much as I love them, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Bruce Willis and Sylvester Stallone action movies from the 80s that I can ground the right. foundation of my identity as a man against. Um, and while everybody finds it entertaining to have the action line, you know, the one liner quip, um, it's not really functional when it comes to raising your kids, interacting with your spouse, interacting with the community at large. Uh, yep. And so um, I think this is really fantastic. Uh, what I'd love to, um, I'd love to have sort of your take on what are sort of the feeders that are kind of causing or, or sort of not feeders, what are the patterns? What are the patterns that you've seen in some of these questions? Because I think these are really, would be really great for us to discuss. And then on top of that, what do you think some of the root causes of these are uh, for the Feel Good Fathers listening? Yeah. We'll go with the questions first and, and kind of the pain points. And many people that reach out to me, either because they find my book or they find the group or whatever, they, they come and approach it from a lens of human connection and emotional connection and, and not knowing how to get there. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, I, I'm a child of the 80s as well. All of the action movies were based on one typically white dude, super muscular, solving the problems on his own through brute force and violence. Okay. Now you see Avengers movies, right, where people are working together. There are more people than just... I mean, there are still, you know, Thor type big muscular dudes, but there's a little bit more diversity in the in the solving and the, the collaboration that goes into fighting the bad guy, so to speak. But for most of us who were raised in the 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, we had this archetype of what manhood should be. And that that archetype does not connect with fatherhood in any way, shape or form, because fathers need to be placing themselves second. They need to be placing themselves as a supporting cast, so to speak. Um, to build those channels of success for their children. And if you are caught up in this idea of, I have to protect, I have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, saving the day, uh, like in Commando, right? He's saving Alyssa Milano, I believe, is the damsel in distress, his daughter, right? Like, how do I swoop in with all my muscles to save my daughter? Well, chances are your child's not going to be kidnapped. Chances are your child is not going to be off in some place. They may have got had a bully or they may have fall scraped their knee. They're not looking for someone to sweep them up. They're looking for someone to emotionally connect and empathize that they have pain and they want to be acknowledged in that pain. And then let's solve it down the road. Right. But the first reaction for a father should be oh, good. 
I was going to say, I think one of the core elements here that I really want to highlight is that nobody wants to be rescued all the time. And our kids exactly. don't want to be rescued all the time. And how do we, one of the core responsibilities of a father is creating a functional adult, raising a functional yep. adult, somebody that can stand on their yep. own two feet. And the single best way to do that is to give layered responsibility and self-identity and to foster who that person is from the ground up by either expanding their skill set, helping them thrive, being curious in who they are, encouraging their exploration, and as you're saying, supporting them intellectually, emotionally, and physically along the way. Right? Yep. It's not a it's not a matter of like, hey, you got a C on your test, let me come in and give you an A. Like you can't do that. <laughs> it doesn't work. No. The world doesn't work that way. And if you do that, then they're going to always be dependent on you, right? Like, and that's yeah. not what we want. We want our kids to grow up and thrive and go do amazing things. Um, the other piece, though, that I would always often get from dads is a question around like, what's the best book for me to read, right? Like, I need a book to be a better dad. And while I wrote a book, and I think it's great, I will, I will undercut myself and every other author to say there is no perfect book, right? There is no one book that will help you with your one child because that child is going to have a unique sensibility and it's going to be different than the second or third or even fifth or sixth child that you have. No two children are the same. And so if you create a playbook for the first child, you're going to have to edit it for the second. And so you're going to have to have like 20 books and no one has time to read all of those books unless you're like a speed reader and congrats to you. And so my kind of rule of thumb as I was writing my own book and doing all the research was how am I co-creating a manual with my child and mm -hmm. to, to your point how am i helping my child find their voice how am i helping my child dictate their life and build their life but in within the boundaries so to speak of my values of what i hold to be true and allowing some flexibility there because i want my child to be an instigator i want her to go out and rebel just not all the time because we still need a little bit of order in our home and and I think that's the challenge that all of us as men need to face is, OK, it's not about us anymore. How do we slow down? How do we stop flexing our muscles? How do we allow our children to grow up and be amazing in partnership with us? And so so really, like, the as I said, like the two big questions are, how do I connect with my kid and what are the books to help me get there? And then after that, a lot of it is just like developmental stuff, right? It's like, uh, how do I change diapers? How do I, how do I do sleep training? And, and there are books for those. And those are all fairly simple solutions, right? But the emotional piece, right? Like, that's such a great area. And so many of us were raised as men not to care about those emotions or to push them aside and, and push them away. And we can you know talk about that in a minute. But I'll just I'll just finish with the other piece that I always stress with dads is how is how is the relationship with your partner? Right. If, whether it's a heterosexual relationship, a homosexual relationship, whatever. The relationship you have with your partner, the co-parents, whether you're living with them, not however it is, is also setting a stage for what your child is going to look to for healthy relationships down the road. And whether that's and, and it's not just the, the co-parent, right? Like, is it your neighbor? Is it your your parents or your cousins, whatever? How they see you engage in relationships with other people is also going to set up that template for them. And so I really stress with dads, it's not just building that emotional connection with your child. It's also how are you demonstrating healthy emotional regulation and, and maturity to all those people around you? I love that. One of the, the core elements I think that growing up was a great piece of advice was uh, really watching how any individual person treats everybody. So it's not how are you treating the people that you like? It's also treating how are the people that are serving you? How are you, how are you treating the people that are lower on a socioeconomic status uh, level from you? So the, the classic thing is like, does the, the classic story rather is does the CEO treat the janitor with dignity and respect? You know, right. uh, in that world, like that's a, uh, I think the term we used to have, and I'd love to have a new term here would be the stand up guy. Are you being the stand up guy? Are you? Are you uh, charismatic? Are you are you leading from the front? Because I think something that um, once it's said, everybody's like, well, yeah, that's common knowledge. It's that our kids parrot us. They're watching us and they adopt their mannerisms and they learn their moral set and they learn their values 
from not only like more so from what we do than what we say. You know, mm -hmm. especially when they're young, especially when they're you know seven and younger. Once you get older, you can kind of have a couple of discussions about different elements, and you can kind of provide more of a, a framework for a didactic reasoning and what they're doing, give them more of a discernment tool set. But before that, everything's emotional. They, that's how they process everything. So they're looking yeah. at your facial expression and they're looking for you to be proud of them. And they're looking, uh, very recently there was a, um, my daughter is not that great at finding things. So she'll lose the remote or she'll lose the book or she'll lose the keys. And I think it's common and, um, and so it, she takes it really hard when she can't find something because then my wife or I will come into the room and be like, it's right there. <laughs> like, you know, like that thing you were looking for, it's right here. And so um, recently I've like in this particular world, I've, I've gone, I've started to, cause she's a bit older, she's turning 11. I've started to enroll her in a, do you want to help develop the skill? Do you want to learn more about how to find things? Do you want to like, cause it's, this is attention to detail. This is um, persistence. This is, uh, checking all the corners, right? All the things that, that make, you know, a, a really, it's a really good skill set to have is it's applicable to everything in a professional and personal life. Um, yep. So you said, so I'd like to talk just a, a little bit more, give your, get your insight on um, the relationship with your spouse, because we just kind of talked about mm -hmm. it a little bit more, like just a little bit. And then I really want to go back to creating that emotional connection, because I think this is a place where you and I can go deep and have a, a really meaningful conversation for, for feel good fathers out there. So let's talk a little bit about spouse and then emotion on the back. Yeah. Do you have a specific question or you want me to just dive in? Just dive Sorry. in. Sorry. Really? Okay. <laughs> That's all good. Cool. <laughs> so, you know, my wife and I, I'll just use us as an, as an example. We, um, we had a pretty gender balanced relationship before uh, children. Uh, I loved cooking. I loved some of the things that are more traditionally feminine. Um, whereas she has, you know, a, a very well established physical therapy practice and is very math and, and science driven. I'm more emotional. I tend to, you know, be the, the writer and the, the poet of us. Right. So we kind of broke different types of gender stereotypes in our personalities. And so in our home, we just kind of fell into a balanced rapport in the home. And then then all of a sudden our kids came along and we just slipped right right into the gender stereotype rules of she taking some time off and taking then only a partial return to work where she was working 30 instead of 40, 40 hours a week. And that was planned. It was totally fine. But because she was home more, she tended to just notice things and do things because I was commuting to work and, and had more time outside of the office. And without really planning on it very unintentionally, we just slipped into these, these roles. And when around the time I started having these dad conversations and as we geared up for baby number two, we realized this imbalance was not healthy and my wife was becoming resentful and I was coming just becoming somewhat disconnected and resentful. I mean, it's a strong word, but somewhat resentful too, that she got to have all this extra time with the kids because I was working for an employer that didn't have leave. So anytime I wanted to take extra time at home, it was, sick days or personal days. And we also love to go travel. So I can't just take a personal day whenever I want, if I'm saving up my vacation. Right. So, yeah. So there's this kind of this unintentional breakdown happening. And so thankfully we've, we've reinvested, invested in that. Um, there's some great resources out there. Uh, Eve Rodsky wrote a book called fair play, a uh, phenomenal approach to kind of breaking down and gamifying home tours. Um, there's another book behind me, uh, parents who lead, that really look at leadership development theory um, and, and applying that into the home. And of course, in my book, I use servant leadership as an approach to fatherhood, laying out like, how are you being a servant to your family? And so putting forward activities, um, mindset shifts that allow you to still see yourself as the man of the house, if that's how you need to define yourself, but, but putting that practically in a different sort of light than only grounding it in being a breadwinner because if you only ground your identity as a breadwinner and then you lose your job that's a crisis right and we've already kind of hinted at the mental health stuff um but that's that's easy ground to to slip deeper into some really serious mental health issues how um, do you your background is a little bit in in some ministry and some more traditional yeah. roles so because what we're talking about is like a 
I don't even know if it's a 2.0, but I'm just for the, the top for this discussion, there's 1.0, which is more the traditional roles. 2.0 is sort of the modern, the modern context. How do we, you know, when half of the let's we're in the US, we're based in the US. So yeah. half of the country is like tradition, tradition, tradition. The other half of the country, uh, country is like you figure it out, it's it's based in the individual. What's the what's the happy what's the happy medium? What where is the Venn diagram where they can both meet and not feel like there's an affront to either extreme view? That's a great question. And I don't know if I have the perfect answer, but I'll give my response. My take is that I don't think they're mutually exclusive, right? Like if you and your partner decide one is working and one is staying home and you can afford to live off one salary, go for it, right? But that doesn't mean that the parent that stays home is the parent 24 seven, right? Like they're going to need some mental breaks. They're going to need to have a life where they connect with other adults. Because if they spend all day talking to a three-year-old, they're going to lose some mental capacity. <laughs> uh, I joke, but you know, I've definitely caught myself talking to a child, to an adult, and slipping into dad voice sometimes, right? And mm -hmm. so, um, but on the same time, if you are only working twenty-four-seven, and your whole mind is shifted to I have to work to perform to perform my duties and to provide financially, and then a bubble burst, a pandemic strikes, you name it you don't have those kind of resources to fall back on. You don't have alternate identities, alternate values to really dictate who you are. And that's where problems arise. And so if you are going to have a more traditional route, how do you and your partner set up spaces where the one who stays home gets a couple hours off in the evening or gets a weekend every so often where they can go away and just have a, a dad's night, a mom's night, a, a girl's weekend, you name it, right? Those are things that we all need to re to remain balanced and 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 to, to touch base with who we are as individuals. I mean, there's also a a part of this where when my kids were born, I was like, great, I get to play with my Legos again and not feel ashamed or feel awkward that I'm playing with my Legos. But that could go for any number of toys, right? And or any number of activities. Like I'm playing Uno again all the time, sometimes too much. But I didn't play that for years because most grown people don't play Uno with grown friends at a bar. So how do you see the joy of reinventing games that you had as a child and seeing life through the lens of your children when you're not working and allowing that to be a part of your identity. And I know plenty of blue collar guys that are working long day labor jobs or in the, you know, the grittiest of work, right? Like that dirty job show that used to be on the discovery channel. Plenty of those dads want to be present in their children's life. And Nothing's to say that white collar, you know, data analysts are the only ones who are allowed to be at home because or to be balanced. Right. Because there's plenty of highly functioning CEOs and director level dads who work long, long hours that don't show up for their families in, in the ways that we like to put on those deadbeats that that leave their family behind. So like there's a fatherless issue that kind of is an undercurrent to all this, just to put a word a word or a name to this. Yeah. And this is the, you know, when I, when I think about the Genesis, again, another Genesis moment was when I realized the impact that our, that the kids, the fatherless kids were having on their life. Dad's yeah. not in the house. It's like 40% of the American population. Uh, when we combine that with the poverty numbers, 10 million households in the U S are um, food insecure, meaning one or fewer meals per day. 60% of those households have at least one adult in the house that are earning above 65, like 65 or more in the house. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. like, there's this major issue. Uh, and so like, sorry, when I said that 60%, I want to quantify that for people, for the listeners, that's 6 million houses. That's at least 6 million kids are food insecure. Yeah. And, um, and when we think about like the mission, what's the mission of feel good fatherhood? Part of it is, yes, how can we enrich and deepen ourselves to make sure that we're creating the best household for ourselves, that we're improving us, that we're feeling good in everything that entails, and we're imparting that feeling good to everybody else and building more communities and neighborhoods and friendship groups and great and, you know, and contributing more and more to society. But on the other side, it's also like pulling and bootstrapping along 
this redefinition of what this role is, because fatherhood is a new role that happens, mm -hmm. you know, that happens with interactions. And, um, and how do we redefine that so that those populations where they're not in the house, where they do, where they do leave, or the, we're calling them a deadbeat, which is an older term, but when the man chooses not to be there, that there's an entire society around him that says, no, 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 this is the standard. We used to define it as the shotgun wedding, right? That was the old standard was like, if you sire a child, you will get married and do the thing. But nowadays it should be, we should all, especially as fathers, pointing to the one who decides he's not gonna be in the house and saying, get in the house, go resolve this, go be with your kids, go contribute in some yeah. meaningful way. You know, don't create hardship because the numbers are, are staggeringly bad. Staggeringly well, bad for these kids, you know? Yeah, it, it totally, totally bad. And I think the, the reason I mentioned it's not just the relationship you have with your partner, but other adults in your children's lives is for that very fact, right? And not to get into the politics of it all, but, you know, there were decisions made in the 50s and 60s that said, you know, if you are a divorced single mom, you get more government subsidies and you are eligible yeah. for government funding. Right. And so for low income families and disproportionately African-American families, that meant the husband had to leave and the dad had to be gone. And there's an institutional level to this that we don't have to get into for this. You know, this it's a bit of beyond the scope of our conversation, but I think there's a, a level to this conversation that doesn't get discussed because of the racial undercurrents of it. Um, and, and that, you know, that has implications for, you know, prison pipelines and, and school, to prison pipelines, all those kind of things. And yet we don't like to turn the lens back on, as I mentioned earlier, those, you know, wealthy parents that have, one parent gone all the time, they hire a nanny, they hire help, that mm -hmm. the child has healthy role models around them, but the two most important people, they see a distance there, right? And and that's just as detrimental. And and not to say all healthy, not all wealthy people are like this, right? Like we're talking in extremes, but I think there's, there's plenty of blame to be held by everyone. Yeah. And so part of why we called the organization Fathering Together is because of the fact that we need to father together. We need to be able to rely on our neighbors, our friends. I mean, my neighbor and I are fairly different in our approach to fatherhood and in our, in our backgrounds, but our kids love each other. We knocked down a part of our fence during the pandemic so we could kind of just let kids roam around in our backyards. And, and it's been great. You know, there's a trust there that we've built. And if I need to run to the store or take one kid to practice, I could just, shoot over a text and be like, hey, can you watch my kids for 15 minutes? Generally speaking, the answer is yes, right? And and we kind of support one another in those endeavors. And I think more and more people are starting to fall back on that or return to those days uh, if they aren't already there. Because again, there's just too much going on for a nuclear family to be able to cope with everything. Um, 100%. And the yeah. 100%. Uh, and for, for those of you listening or watching there will be some additional articles and discussions around these topics that I'll put in the show notes for, for your perusal after the fact. Uh, the second part was about emotion. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> the emotional management, uh, uh, cause that, that was a, it, that, I think that was a good stop on that, that particular, that particular point. Sure. So let's, let's yeah. talk about, um, well, let's talk about emotional maturity. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I like to use the term emotional courage, uh, how are you emotionally courageous? Uh, my colleague, John Bedalament, who's done a lot of curriculum design and, and educational training within our, our network at Fathering Together, I, I wanna give him credit for, I think, initially coining the phrase in a, in a random team meeting we had. But I think oftentimes we think of emotions as a weakness. Uh, most men are taught to be happy or angry. Uh, sometimes we can be sad, but only at maybe a funeral or we can show emotional tears when our team wins at the Super Bowl. But beyond those three, we're really at a loss for what we're allowed to demonstrate in our culture. And we see it all the time when politicians cry, they get lambasted. When um, someone shows any sort of um, envy or jealousy, they get labeled as the villain. And that's not healthy, <laughs> to, to put it bluntly and succinctly, for anyone, right? And so for us as men, 
if we are operating at quote unquote a deficit of emotional expression how are we going to train our children to have a broad range of emotions and how are we going to able how will we be able to communicate with them on more emotional levels and one if thing, your kid one thing i want to yeah. one thing i'd like to add here that um is an undercurrent and we discussed this off air uh for the feel good father listening or for anybody who's listening the emotion still exists the right. men men will feel all of these emotions just as much as anybody else. What I think what we're really talking about here is the allowed the, the allowed expression. I think, and you did mention this, the expression of all these individual emotions for the consequences that are imparted to that to that individual. Um, yeah. Largely, there's a lot of societal pressures, and then there's a lot of media and cultural pressures on what those are. Um, I, yeah. I simply wanted to say that because I think it's really important for um, well for for a feel good father, for you to understand that you do have the emotion, you basically you just may not have the language around it, and you may not have permission either from yourself or the people around you to express it. Correct, correct. And if you aren't giving yourself permission, if you're not demonstrating that and expressing that effectively and putting it into words, then your children are going to be struggling too. And you start to see this. I don't want to use this phrase lightly, but a generational trauma that is starting to that we see, right? And we were talking offline about my dad, and I, I talk about him a lot in my book, that he really broke the mold for emotional expression for me. He allowed me to cry. He allowed me to be who I was. He never shamed me. Uh, obviously, there were times where he was like, maybe now is not a crying moment, right? Like, is this worth your tears kind of language? But he never said, don't cry, or it's unmanly for you right now. But a lot of that was because my grandfather was not the greatest of guys. He was absent. He was very misogynistic at times. And he just never, as my dad told me, he never showed interest in what my dad had interests in sports, activities, girls, whatever. So my dad grew up with a male figure in his life, but not a male friend or a companion for when tough situations came up. And my dad was very clear with me early on. I mean, I remember like, fifth or sixth grade when I, I first started liking girls and I think I said something about it. His response was, hey, if you ever have a question, no matter how embarrassing it might sound, you can ask it and I will not. Like, it will not be a problem. Right. And I think that was so abnormal for the early 90s for a dad to be that open and supportive emotionally. Uh, but when I asked him about that, as I was researching for my book and like why he was doing this, he said, you know, there was a shift that he was feeling that some of his dad friends were also experiencing kind of a cultural shift in the early 80s with the civil rights movement, with some women's liberation movements and other things that he was like, I could be holding back and, and reliving the 40s and 50s, or I could push forward and create a better life for my child. And not just me, my sister, too. And some of my other dad friends who I spoke to for my my book, they said the almost the exact same thing. Like, yeah, we just all kind of made this pact that we were going to allow our children to be more emotionally expressive than we were allowed to be. And so I don't know if there was something in the water in my hometown or if there was just this like perfect divine moment that all of my dad friends, my dad's friends, I should say, uh, agreed to. But um, I got real, I got really lucky. And when I talk with dads now, they are following in my dad's footsteps, right? They are the ones saying, I want to break these chains of emotional disconnection. I want to start being more emotionally expressive and, and stepping up for my kids so that they know how to express all of the emotions that they're going to experience. Uh, it's really heartening, but that doesn't mean it's not really hard and not a challenge every step of the way. And so I try to be there for them and also acknowledge like just because my dad was emotionally liberated and, and shared things with me and allowed me to be expressive, it doesn't mean I wasn't deep in the culture of masculinity. I mean, there's definitely moments where I got to college and I was like, all right, I got a man up. I got to, I got to, you know, flirt with girls. I got to like be all tough and stuff. And it was stupid. Right. And it led to a lot of abusive relationships or not, abusive, sorry, abusive behaviors internally for me over drinking at parties, uh, you know, depression and anxiety around social settings or what it meant to be friends with guys. Thankfully, though, I got through it and I'm doing everything I can to help other men get through it as well. And 
I've got a great network of, of friends and colleagues within Fathering Together and beyond that are all kind of looking to make some of that change too. That's awesome. So super quick, um, do you think there's a difference because uh, a difference in the raising of daughters versus the raising of sons? And I'm asking this because I have daughters, you have daughters, uh, we both know Chris, he's got daughters. Yeah. I'm curious if uh, within this network, because I, I, I know that I, I perceive some minor differences, but I'd be interested in your perspective from the, from the community, fathering together, the whole deal. Like, are there differences in the ways that we, that we show up for our sons versus our daughters? I mean, the quick answer is yes. Obviously, like everywhere you turn, boys are treated differently than girls. Uh, even the most emotionally aware dads like me and Chris and you, like we still show up differently. And, and yet I try my best. And I think critically about my, my neighbor who has a son and daughter, like, how am I treating his son? Do I just slip right into the, like, Hey, let's play sports or Hey, let's rough house. No, I, I do everything I can to fight against that. Even though his son is very much into the active kind of play. But on the same token, like, do I rough house with my daughters? Heck yeah. I, I like we we tickle and wrestle all the time and they fight back. Sometimes they get some good some good licks in when I'm not expecting it. But I think the, the the similarity that needs to happen is when you make mistakes, when something comes up, you have to be able to quickly say, I'm sorry, I still love you. I'm putting myself in timeout as your dad because I made a mistake, just like I put you in timeout when you make mistakes. And show that you're, quote unquote, not above the law or the or the rules of your house, but also you're helping your child, regardless of how they identify, manage the emotions, manage the experiences and make meaning out of the experiences that they're having. Both in terms of the individual engagement of like, hey, this is how I feel in this moment. But then as they start to get older, how are you helping them understand the the social justice themes around them? Right. I mean, George mm -hmm. Floyd impacted all of us. That was a huge moment in 2020. And my daughter was six at the time. And she asked me, like, hey, is is her best friend who is a black kid in her class? Is he going to be shot like George Floyd? That's a heavy, heavy thing. Any child, let alone a six year old, needs to be wrestling with. Right. Yet we know all of those kind of conversations happen all the time in black families. But how do we as white families understand the larger social justice implications and, and how do we help our children understand how to navigate those before a crisis comes up so that they have within the right, you know, d developmental lens of their ages and whatnot, a, a response and a, an, a, an appropriate response to that. That's good. Um, we're going to leave that one there because that's a whole can. Yes, so. that is a whole can. <laughs> That's a whole can. Um, yes, I keep opening fine. cans that we can open, we can close another day maybe, but sorry to, to throw too many out there. Uh, it, it, it's okay. The, the, uh, it's okay because there's a time and a place and over a podcast discussion, um, unless we were solution focused or doing something like that, like right now we're kind of hitting the surface and that's okay. Uh, there are places and time to do more deeper dives into all of this um, and feel good fathers, those are coming up. So that's, and that's really important. And there's plenty of communities and discussion out there for that. Um, let's talk about Father's Friday and the, the genesis of this and yeah. what, what, what's the purpose? What is it about? How did it begin? Um, let's jump in. Yeah. And a lot of the cans I'm opening are going to be discussed in these, these follow-up conversations throughout Father's Friday. So great segue. Uh, so Father's Friday began three years ago, sort of in response to a call to action from a colleague of mine who invented Mother's Monday. Mother's Monday is going on right now, and it is a celebration of women returning to work after leaving to become moms. And, and what are the skills, what are the, the assets that moms need to have to flourish back in the workplace? And it was great. I love it. I'm a huge supporter of the movement. And when I was on this planning committee three years ago, I kind of put out there in a meeting, where's my spot in right this is all about mom's motherhood returning to work where's a dad's place in this this campaign that they were developing and they all kind of looked at me and said we don't know where do you think you should be uh 
And, you know, I, obviously I was an amplifier and a champion ambassador, what have you for that day. But as I thought about it, and as we continued to discuss Father's Friday kind of evolved out of these conversations, not as a way to celebrate fathers returning to work or whatnot, but more so how are we inviting fathers to step away from work on the weekends? How are dads disengaging with their, their breadwinner, their corporate identity, their whatever, however they work and be present in the home, emotionally connect. A lot of the things that we've just been discussing, how are we inviting dads into those conversations? And so the first year we, it was just one day. It was the father. It was the Friday before father's day here in the United States. We did a number of pre-recorded conversations and invited dads to think reflectively and, and deeply on issues of work-life balance, of being an advocate, um, you know, using your privilege, your strength for good. And then last year we did a This Working Dad Cares campaign all around how are dads demonstrating their commitment outside of the workplace, Little League coaches, scout troop leaders, you, you name it, right? How are dads showing up and caring in their communities? And because of the success of those two campaigns, and because I don't like to dream small, a number of guys were we were discussing, you know, back around the the new year, what Father's Friday would look like this year. And so this year, it's not one day. We had too many ideas, so it's going to be a series of conversations happening every Friday, starting in June, and basically the Father's Day in the United States through Father's Day in Australia, which is in early September. And so every Friday, there will be a different focus. The first third around mental health, like we talked about, suicide ideation, the stresses of life. The middle third around how do we raise our children effectively? What are the strategies we need to have, the mindset we need to carry? And then the last third is how do we put all that into use? What are the strategies to end gender-based violence, to be advocates for pay equity in the workplace, champions for women and people of color, you name it, right? Like, how are we as dads becoming change agents rather than watching everybody else around us do the changing? Because we have to change with the world or else we're going to get left behind. And the initial plan was just to do the Friday conversations. And we've got, you know, three or four panelists on every Friday. So we've got over 50 people involved in, in various shapes and forms. It's great. I'm so excited for it. We'll we'll make sure, you know, go to fathersfriday.org to, to see the full schedule. But as we started to kind of like softly launch things over the last few weeks, we got a lot of feedback saying, hey, what can we do right now? How can I use these skills in conversation? How do I find a group to support? And so we're actually still getting volunteers to do some book clubs, to do some Zoom calls and, and some check-ins for dads to find some space to help hold accountability. But then also there's so many on the ground local efforts being done. Keegan Alba started a statewide organization called Dad Guild in Vermont, hugely successful. It's an amazing group. They do play dates at, at schools and playgrounds for dads who want to connect with other dads, but also, you know, just let their kids be kids and let their partners have some time off. So dads in Vermont, if you're listening, check out Dad Guild. There's a community near you. Uh, Antoine in Buffalo is running a, a citywide program for new dads through the city to help dads learn how to be better dads, both in terms of those practical steps of changing diapers, as well as that emotional connection that they need to have with their children. And so you know, there's all these local efforts happening all over the country. And as Fathering Together kind of grew during the pandemic, we remained virtual, as I already mentioned. So we didn't necessarily have deep roots in any one community. We just kept finding these communities and, and directing people there. And so while Father's Friday is at heart a raising awareness of how to be healthy and engaged as fathers today, it's also kind of a conduit for local efforts and skills and strategies for dads who are looking for that next step and uh, who are eager to be more than they ever thought they could be because we have so much capacity within us as dads. Uh, we just need to be given a chance and, and a few, you know, nudges and pushes here and there too. I was going to, I wanted to add there. I love the given a chance, but I also, I think activating sort of some of that traditional masculine energy and just stepping into it and, and yeah. sometimes, and sometimes in the servant leadership, you've just got to step to the front and say, no, no, I'm doing this. No, no, I don't need recognition. No, no, this is the path forward. This is who I'm yeah. going to be and how I'm going to show up. Yep. Awesome. One of Brian. My... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, one of my favorite, uh, favorite professors told me in class one day and the rest of us, there's some sort of demonstration happening, right? In the downtown Chicago area. And we were talking about it at the start of class and they said, you know, for every leader who's at the front of that campaign, 
leading the parade down the street. There's a handful of leaders back at the church or the community center, what have you, making sure there's food because everybody's going to come back hungry. And those are the people also with the bail money to get people out of jail, right? So we need both leaders. And I tend to be the one back at the church making the soup, making whatever. Uh, but you can't have a movement without both, right? And and so as dads, there's no shame in being the alpha male, getting out front, leading a group of kids on a hike. But there's got to be some dads back making sure that there's food ready, making sure that there's a comforting system in place. So yeah, it takes all of us to, to make this work. And throughout Father's Friday, we're going to highlight all those things. So thanks Absolutely for love it. giving that chance. Yeah. So, um, Brian, what are the URLs where people can find information? We had fatheringtogether.org. What are the what are the various URLs? Yeah, so fatheringtogether.org is our our main site for all things fathering together. Uh, the campaign for Father's Friday is fathersfriday.org. Uh, it'll direct you to a couple different sites. And uh, if you want to get learn more about Mother's Monday, it's mothersmonday.org. Path Forward is a nonprofit that organizes that. Uh, and then you know if you just look up handles at fathering together on most social media you're going to find us that way too far out awesome uh brian anderson everybody thanks for having me